Oh, all right, my darlings, it looks like it's about time to get started. You guys ready? We have so many strange things to talk about today. I'm very excited. Um, so, first, does anybody have any pressing questions before we get kicking on Civil War stuff? I can only see a couple of you, so that's probably okay. You guys doing okay? <laughs> I feel like it's been a long time since I last saw you. So many things have happened. The AC is out of my apartment and I am dying. It is hotter in here than it is outside. Last night I had to just sit next to my open freezer to not like die of heat stroke. You should go stand like waist deep in a pond like cows do. I don't know where you'll find one, but I tried that one time and it works. Uh, I don't, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty good cooling mechanism. Oh, bless whoever invented air conditioning which is probably lots of people simultaneously in different places around the world, but whatever, bless all of them. So, um, how did you guys like going with the wind? <laughs> uh, I cannot wait uh, for the big discussion on Thursday. That movie is, is a lot. Um, so my, my plan is that what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about uh, the movie itself and especially like, what a lot of those characters were meant to be representing um, and what parts were real and what parts weren't. And then on Wednesday, tomorrow, we're going to talk about the impact of the movie um, because the movie sort of exists separately from its like massive social impact. Um, so today we'll talk about the movie itself and then tomorrow we'll talk about why everyone thinks it was real. So if you guys are ready, I shall go ahead and share my screen and we will look at a very beautiful slideshow. All right, so um, there, there's just so much, so much to discuss. What a movie. Um, so what I want to do is essentially what I like to do with all of the books, which, which is kind of place it in history and also talk about who the author was and why that's important. So first of all, um, God with the Wind was a book first and it came out in 1936. Um, so this is a really, really old story. But even then, it's, it takes place or it was written long after the events that it's about. So it, it wasn't written, you know, during the Civil War. It was written by essentially the granddaughter of people who were in the Civil War. So it came out in uh, 1936 and it was huge. Um, it was just a massive success. Like nobody had ever seen anything like it. It went straight to the top of the charts. It sold lots and lots and lots of copies. Um, it won the Pulitzer Prize that next year, which is always a big deal. Um, and the, why it's kind of weird that all of these things happened is because its author was an unknown. This was her first ever book. Um, so this is her, this is Margaret, or Margaret Mitchell. And she is an Atlanta native. Um, and she essentially grew up hearing all of these stories. Um, so she lived exactly 1900 to 1949. Um, and she used to work for the Atlanta Post Constitution, which we'll talk about in a second. So for her, a lot of the story was really personal. So her family um, on both sides immigrated to Northern Georgia from Ireland, which may sound familiar. That's a large part of like why she sort of wrote the story the way that she did. Um, and she definitely had ancestors who fought in the Civil War, and she had family that had houses up there. So a lot of what she wrote was essentially based on her grandmother's memories, uh, things that her grandmother told her when she was little. So um, this is her talking about her own grandmother, and she's talking about uh, the world that these people lived in and how secure it was and how it exploded beneath them. And so this is kind of a recurring theme through the book and through the movie, this idea that people were very secure in their little world, like they knew exactly what was going to happen. Uh, they knew exactly what would happen to their children, but then kaboom. Um, so in a sense, the book is about trying to deal with that, about trying to deal with this idea that um, your world has sort of blown up around you and now you have to do something completely different. It's about reconstruction, essentially, about a person going through changes and trying to emerge on the other side. So she said, essentially, um, this is what happened to her, her grandmother, and so this is what she was trying to sort of reckon with, this idea that the world is going to explode underneath her. So I think it's kind of interesting to know a little bit about Margaret Mitch's life, and also she was an interesting woman. Um, so she was pretty well educated for, for women at the time, um, and she was raised, right, educated, uh, you know, thoughtful parents. Her father was a lawyer, her mother was a suffragette, and the suffragettes were the women who were trying to get the vote for women. Uh, it was mostly white women and they met white women. Um, but the suffragettes were kind of brave. They were like, you know, liberal forerunners of their day. Um, 
Um, so she was given like an, an excellent education um, in high school and she went to like the only good women's college, which was Smith at the time, um, but she only was there for one year because her mother caught the pandemic of 1918 in terms of like history repeating itself, right? Um, so her mother fell uh, to the Spanish flu and died, so she came home after one year of college um, and sort of took her place in Atlanta society. So at the time, if you were the wealthy daughter of wealthy people, you often made your debut into society, and this is what we call um, like a debutante. So essentially, there, there really is like a, a great big party and all of the girls that wear white dresses and they come out, and it's sort of like, these are available for purchase now. Uh, like in the olden days, that's essentially what it was. It was like, they are ready now for the marriage market. Um, and so she became a debutante, she became sort of a society girl. Um, she was known for being kind of uh, flirtatious, which was very scandalous at the time. And so she married relatively young, uh, but it was an unsuccessful marriage. They were only married for about a year. Her husband was abusive. And eventually, after about a year, um, she divorced him and married his best friend, which is a scandal. Um, but she also worked outside the home, which was really unusual for women at the time. So she wrote uh, for the Atlanta Journal, which has since become the AJC. And she lived in this house right here. And you may have seen this house before. Uh, this house is right next to the Midtown Mall Station. And it wasn't always uh, precisely where it is, but they picked it up and moved it over there to make it a landmark. Um, so if you feel like going on a field trip, that's the, that's the house uh, in which she was living when she wrote this. So basically what happened um, was she was, you know, like young and married and she had um, a recurring injury to her ankle. So she was stuck in the house. And she was bored. And her husband got tired of reading her library books because she kept sending them out, you know, every couple days to come back with a stack full of books. And he said, for God's sake, Peggy, can't you write a book instead of reading thousands of them? Um, and she was like, fine, I will. And she did. Uh, and it took her like three or four years and she didn't tell anybody. So people would come over to her house all the time and she would like hide the manuscript under her furniture and things like that. Um, this is her office in which she was writing it and this is part of the museum. Uh, so you can see the typewriter on which she was writing it uh, and essentially the furniture that she had available. So basically she was bored so she wrote a novel and it took ages and she wasn't going to publish it. Um, but then essentially somebody said that she was too cowardly to publish it and she couldn't stand dares so she did. Um, so essentially, a bored young woman wrote a book about, um, you know, her grandmother's life, and this is what it became. So in a lot of ways, the book is very accurate. Um, she spent a lot of time talking to people. Uh, she went to, like, retirement homes and talked to people. She went to, like, you know, people's, like, grandparents' houses and talked to people, talked to, talked to, talk. She read all of the newspapers. She read a lot of journals. Uh, she looked at a lot of letters. So... In a sense, a lot of what the people were feeling was very, very accurate. But there's one notable exception, which you probably noticed, uh, which is that Margaret Mitchell basically didn't talk to anybody who wasn't white. So a lot of what the white characters are going through is very real. Um, and especially a lot of what Scarlett was going through is very real. But she just completely failed to acknowledge the other, you know, half of the population. So nothing about what the, you know, the slaves were going through was real, and really not much about what, like, the carpetbackers later on were going through was real. So it's kind of an interesting book in that sense, and that's going to become really important later on. So she did a lot of research, but, like, not enough. Um, and then people read this book. And the thing that's really important to remember is that like almost everybody read this book. Um, it was huge on the bestseller lists. A lot of people, um, listed as their favorite book uh and so people didn't think it would be that popular because it cost three dollars which is pretty epic this was right during the depression and three was a lot of dollars um and also it was long the book itself is so long um probably more than 500 pages for sure it's a big old chunk of a book um so people thought it wouldn't sell but then it did and she was like suck it no, um but she never wrote another book she wrote this book and she was kind of embarrassed of it and she kept working as a journalist for a little while, but she never wrote another novel. And people really wanted her to because it ends on kind of a cliffhanger, but she never did. Um, and there's a possibility that she might have, but one night she was walking across Peachtree and got hit by a car, just like so many other people in Atlanta. That's a relatively common way to die in Atlanta. Um, and so she died when she was 49. So she never really had time to write another book. So she essentially wrote one epic bestseller and then kind of flamed out. So she's buried at Oakland Cemetery. I don't know if you guys have been there, but again, if we went on a field trip, you could go. If you would like to go make a pilgrimage.
Um, and the book itself became its own thing. So really, Margaret Mitchell became sort of outside of the book itself and way outside of the movie itself. So uh, probably we think more than 30 million copies of the book have sold. Um, and it's the thing that's important about the, the book and the movie as well is that a lot of people throughout different generations have loved it. So it's created a picture of the South for generations of people, not just Americans either. It's certainly not just Southerners. Like a lot of people, when they think about like, oh, what does the South look like? They think about this book and they think about this movie because this is one of our like lasting sort of tributes. Um, so the book itself, massive. Pulitzer Prize, copy sold. Here's Clark Cable reading it uh, after he took the role of Red Butler. And the movie became even bigger. So they optioned the rights for the book real fast after it came out. Um, the making of the movie was a whole complex thing that I'm not going to get into, but basically it involved a whole bunch of producers and a whole bunch of directors and like a two year search for who would play Scarlett. And it was like a really complex thing. But the movie serves as essentially one of the like primary examples of the golden age of Hollywood. So <laughs> Outside of everything else, and trust me, we'll talk about everything else, um, it was a te like technological advancement. Uh, the use of color was a big old change. Uh, a lot of the technology was a big old change. So the movie itself has a sort of a place in movie history solely for that, but also uh, for the legacy of the, the story that was told. So it's almost all the time on the like top 100 film lists. Um, it's considered one of our great American classics. Like you've already heard of it because it is so famous. So uh, the premiere was a great big old deal. It was held at the Lowe's Grand Theater, which is not there anymore. It was at the corner um, of Peach Street and Forsyth. And I think that's where like um, the Civic Center Marta Station is now. The, the theater's not there anymore, but it was held like right downtown. And it was this massive event. Like the theater really did it up big. They had premieres in other cities too, like in Hollywood and in New York, but the Atlanta premiere was the thing. Um, and it went on for like three days and the mayor basically shut down the city and there were all these events and all these people in costume and like 300,000 people tried to come. So it was a great big old deal. Um, and a lot of the stars came and you know, they took pictures. But the black stars were not allowed to attend. Uh, the theater itself was still segregated, so they wouldn't have been, you know, allowed to come inside. So they didn't attend at all. So that was another example of the like giant massive racism that we're going to see coming up here. So that year, it basically scooped the Academy Awards. So it was nominated for 13, which was a record at the time. Uh, some other movies have, have gotten more nominations than that since then, but um, it won eight. So it won almost all of the important things. It won Best Actress uh, for Scarlett and Best Actress in a Supporting Role uh, for her, for, for Mimi. Uh, it got Best Director, Best Screenplay, Best Cinematography, Best Picture. Um, and also it's important to note that 1939 was a big year. There were a lot of really excellent movies that year. Um, and I think it lost the soundtrack to Wizard of Oz, which, fair, best soundtrack ever, maybe. Um, so it was, it was like a big upset that Gone with the Wind sort of like stormed in and took all these awards. Oh, wait, I don't want to show you. We'll talk about this again when we talk about this next week. But Hattie McDaniel, who played uh, Mammy, who, who won the Best Supporting Actress, was the first ever uh, Black actress to win that award. And she also was not allowed to accept the award in, in person. Um, the theater at which they held the Oscars, also segregated. So she wasn't allowed to sit with the rest of the castmates, and she wasn't allowed to go up on stage uh, to accept it. So she made history, and they still sort of like kept her in a corner, which is, again, part of the whole thing. So one of the... I guess like the most epic sort of legacies that the movie leaves behind is that it's arguably the biggest box office success of all time. So there's an asterisk next, next to this, um, but essentially when we're, when we're talking about um, how much money uh, a movie has earned, we count the ticket sales. But when a movie comes out a very long time ago, like for instance 1939, typically we count it in 1939 dollars. So Gone with the Wind has been re-released a bunch of times, like at least 10 times, and every time they re-release it, they count the ticket sales in $1939. So they're trying to sort of account for inflation, but they're not doing it entirely accurately. So by some counts, Gone with the Wind is by far the most uh, high grossing film of all time, and like pretty much everybody who was alive did see it right then. But by other counts, Avengers 4 is massively much bigger. So <laughs> um, it, it depends sort of on how you count it. But if you count it in $1939, yes. But if you count it in like perhaps more accurately adjusted uh, $2,000, uh, $28 now. So in a sense, one of the, the biggest legacies that it left behind was how much money it earned and how many people saw it, again, because of the re-releases. They re-release it in the theaters all the time. 
except for right now. Um, so again, I didn't know what was going to happen in the world when I was designing the syllabus, and here we are. Um, and I certainly didn't anticipate that Gone with the Wind was going to have a moment in the news. Cool. So on June 9th, which uh, feels like several years ago, but was really very recent, um, HBO Max decided to withdraw Gone with the Wind from their online offerings. Um, so HBO Max is like the streaming version of HBO, and I, as far as I can tell, no one has it, but whatever. Um, and they had Gone with the Wind on there because they own the rights to it, but then they decided, in, in light of all of the recent um, you know, focus on, on racial disparity and especially on like systemic racism, that maybe they shouldn't show a deeply racist movie. So they withdrew it. But it had a counter effect, like it sort of backfired. All of these people were like, um, we love Gone with the Wind, bring it back. And so what ended up happening was that a lot of people bought it outright instead of just streaming it. So for like the first time ever, it had a bunch of sales on Amazon. They're thinking about bringing it back, uh, but with a sort of disclaimer, the way that like Disney did with Song of the South and things like that. Uh, but people really got pissed. Uh, so I wanted to show you a couple of these because it's a great example of how we think about things from the past, right? So Senator Ted Cruz, and you've probably seen Ted Cruz before, he has one, more than one problem. Uh, but he said, stop the censorship, you Orwellian statists, which I think is kind of kind of fantastic. So again, you, hopefully you have read uh, George Orwell's 1984 at this point. And one of the things that they do in 1984 is that they have a whole department uh, in charge of rewriting the history books so that they match what we think now. So he's accusing them by removing this from one streaming service of rewriting history. Um, and then, of course, in Breitbart News, they said the woke Taliban have won, which I don't think those two things intersect. I don't think the Taliban is particularly woke. Uh, neither are the woke people members of Taliban, but like, whatever. Um, and then, of course, Megyn Kelly uh, really got pissed. And so she said that if HBO Max is going to remove this, um, they also have to remove every anti-feminine uh, sort of movie or show and everything that it might be anti-LGBTQ. Uh, and so she said they have to remove, like, Game of Thrones and Friends and everything by John Hughes and Woody Allen and basically, like, are they going to take all of the movies away? Like, where does this end? Um, so people really threw a lot of fits about the removal of this movie from one platform, which again, I didn't anticipate, but it's kind of exciting. So I put um, a link to one of these stories on Moodle if you want to have a look at it. But it was very surprising to me that all of a sudden this movie was back in the news. Um, so it matches really nicely with a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about, about like Confederate monuments, uh, which have been hugely in the news in the last couple of weeks. Um, so it's just, again, kind of a, kind of a great example of what we freak out about and why and what it means to us. So now that you have seen it, since I uh, asked for it to be on the streaming service before all of this happened, let's talk about what was like going on in the movie and how much of it is accurate. So um, I want to start with the characters because the characters are all deeply symbolic of essentially what's going on um, in the war itself and especially how people reacted to the world exploding underneath them. So in the book, the characters are actually really well written. Uh, they're like fully sketched humans. They have flaws, they have positives, like they're, they're real people in a sense. In the movie, of course, a lot of that had to slide, but whatever. So we'll start with the O'Hara family. Sorry, so basically we have Gerald and Ellen. And we didn't get much of Ellen's backstory in the movie, but don't worry about it. And then of course they have these three daughters. So let's start with Gerald. Um, so Gerald is a first generation immigrant from Ireland, and this is seen as a real problem, um, especially for like fitting into North Georgia society, like he's considered sort of brash and new, like he's the epitome of new money. Um, you know, like he's loud and drunk all the time. He doesn't have that sort of like quiet stillness that a lot of Southerners have. So he is just a great example of like essentially how we feel about immigrants. He's, he's a recent immigrant. He is not polished. Uh, you know, he is loud. He's constantly making mistakes. So he is sort of an example of like the people that we're afraid of, uh, the people that we think don't fit in here, the people that like don't even have any background in any education, like the people who have only been here for one generation. Like people in, in America and especially people in the South are often very concerned about how long your family has been in this area. And so even if you are a wealthy white plantation owner, if your family has been here for like five minutes, um, it's considered, you know, kind of shameful. So he is essentially kind of this epitome of new money. And normally I would pause to ask you things like what does he represent, uh, but lecturing on Zoom is the worst. Uh, so I'm just gonna kind of keep going. Uh, but if you do have a question, uh, try to raise your hand or something like that so I can help you. So in a lot of ways, I think he's kind of a great character because he's sort of like all id, like he knows what he wants and he yells about it. Um, but he does seriously 
lose his, his mind and like his sense of well-being after his wife dies. So this is his wife. And in, in the book, again, it's a little bit more clear, but she is like old money South. Um, you know, her family has been there for generations. They're from South Carolina, from outside of Charleston. And she is like calm and quiet and cool. She's like the epitome of this other lady. She's always perfectly put together. She's always running the house um, calmly but firmly. I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase of like a velvet fist and the idea is that like you have like a steel fist but you've put it in velvet so nobody can tell. And so that's essentially one of the things that people often use to describe uh, Southern women. So she is sort of um, typifying the, the old school South. She belongs there, she's rich, she's quiet, she's chill, um, but she did marry Gerald. So here we see the sort of the combination of the two, of the brash new immigrant and the chill old money South. Um, and again, in the book, she was a little bit bigger, but whatever. Which brings us to Scotty. Um, and one of the things that we'll talk about uh, tomorrow is the fact that in a lot of ways, people love Scarlett. Like she's a very modern woman in a lot of ways. Like she's, she's very smart. She can do a lot of math in her head. She understands how to run a business. She knows what she wants. She goes after it. Like in a lot of ways, she's a very sympathetic character. Um, but she's also a deeply spoiled narcissistic brat, right? So it is important to remember that at the start of the, of the movie and the start of the book itself, she's supposed to be about 16. So her ideas about like romance and who she should marry and like, how much fun she should be having are really understandable if she's 16. You know what I mean? Like if you think about like who you thought you would marry at 16, it probably was also inaccurate. Um, so in a lot of ways, I think she's sympathetic in that regard. So she is meant to be anyway, this sort of like blend between the brash immigrant and the cool southerner, except that she doesn't really uh, take. <laughs> so she's, she's also kind of all in, but she has learned how to put on this like veneer. So she knows how to put on the trappings of the Southern lady. She knows how to tie her corset really tight and how to flirt and how to not eat that much and how to like, you know, present the correct appearance. But it's very clear that deep down she was never really a lady. Like, and that's, I think, one of the most sympathetic things about her. So her mother and, of course, Mammy have like forced a certain level of behavior upon her. But in reality, she's all in as well. Um, and, and I just love her. So the neighbors who become important are also kind of interesting. So we're not going to talk, you know, too much in depth about them, but I wanted to go over who they are. So the neighbors are very clearly divided into like landowners and what they call poor white trash. Um, so this isn't something that I've heard anybody say in a long time, but I remember like my mother and grandmother saying poor white trash. Um, but essentially there's the, the people who are the established plantation owners, you know, there's the, the Wilkes and the Hamiltons and the Charltons, and they all live nearby. Um, and then there's the Slatteries and the Slatteries, have you know like a couple of acres and they're really struggling um and it's kind of interesting because in the book they talk a lot about them being lazy and kind of yellow and one of the things that we know now that we didn't know then was that a lot of poor southerners were suffering from essentially tapeworms um a, like a a, a variety uh, of parasite that gets into your body and if you don't clear it out with the right kind of medication which they didn't have at the time it makes you real sluggish and you really do turn kind of yellow uh and you never really get much done so in all likelihood all of the people that they used to refer to as like you know like the crackers um had parasites and they we just didn't know it at the time but for the purposes of this movie they're bad they're bad because they're poor and they're bad because they don't have good manners and they're bad because they get a lot of diseases and a lot of this of course is down to like cleanliness that they didn't have available to them at the time, but whatever. Basically, the rich people hate the poor people. That's going to be a theme. So, the Tarleton twins. Okay, so you may remember them from the very beginning of the movie, and basically Scarlett is sort of like simultaneously keeping both of them on the hook, uh, which takes a lot of cleverness. But in the book, one of the things that they talk about is their eagerness to join the war. Uh, they keep getting kicked out of colleges because they're not very good students, um, and so they're more interested in like writing and shooting and fighting and drinking than they are in anything else. And that's, I think, also very human. <laughs> like you probably know guys like this. Like you probably know guys who would much rather just be like getting drunk and shooting guns. And I guess maybe not horses, maybe like four wheelers or something at this point. Um, but essentially they're saying that they don't, they don't like college. They just want to come home and like get drunk and, and rumble and like, you know, flirt with girls. And they don't want to go on the grand tour of Europe. They just want to like, be boys. And so, you know, soon as the war starts, remember at the, at the scene at the picnic, they join up and they are, and again, sorry to like answer all my questions here, but they are representative of a lot of the Southern young men at the time. Um, 
they framed the war like it was going to be really fun and also really fast. And so they were like, oh, yeah, you know, like they joined right up. They were like, this is great. Let's go like shoot our enemies from, I don't know, two weeks, you know, and then we'll come back home victorious and we'll start our lives. So they are essentially, again, representative of like the young country buck, this like young, healthy dude who's delighted to go to war and fight for you. So Ashley provides the counterpoint. Um, so Ashley is in a lot of ways very much like the Charlton twins. Um, you know, he's raised in the same environment. He's a very good writer. He's a very good shot, but he is at his core a little bit different. Like he's a little bit softer. I think he's kind of what, what perhaps we might describe as like a very soft masculinity these days. There've been a lot of questions through the years about whether he was actually gay. I don't think so, but like, well, um, so he, Essentially, he represents the cooler heads. He represents the people who just wanted to like be left alone. Uh, the people who just wanted to like chill at their plantation until they die. Like he just kind of wanted to like read books and think thoughts and like stay home. But he had to go to war because everybody else went. Um, if you recall the scene at the picnic, he says like, if Georgia goes, I go with her. Because his, you know, his masculinity and his reputation and his family's reputation was very much tied up in him sort of going along with the rest of what everybody else was doing. So even though he didn't want to kill anybody and he didn't want to like ride around for, again, what they thought would be a couple of weeks, he went because it was expected of men at the time. And again, this is something that we're going to see when we start reading about World War I. A lot of boys go to war because it is expected of them. Um, to refuse would be like really cowardly, you know, and it would be a huge embarrassment to your family and to you. And so like a lot of young men, even though he didn't necessarily agree with the war, and ultimately he admits that he doesn't agree with slavery, although he gets cagey about that, um, he goes to war because he is expected to. So he's the one that has the hardest time uh, with the war itself and with the social changes. Like he's, he's meant to be sort of exemplary of the people that just cannot accept the change of the old South. Like he is just stuck and he doesn't want to go forward. So he provides a really good counterpoint to Scarlett because Scarlett is sort of like the new South and he is sort of like the old South. Okay. So he marries his cousin, Melanie. Um, and again, it was pretty common to marry your cousins. Like we saw a lot of talk about this in the book about the revolution. Um, it was, it was really common to marry your first cousins. We don't recommend that much anymore because it's not good for the gene pool. Um, but it is a good way to keep wealth in the family. So we tend to see that a lot with, um, like monarchies or with any sort of society that's based on hierarchies or land ownership. Um, it's, if you just keep intermarrying, it's a good way to like keep wealth and power within the family, but it is not a good way to have healthy babies. So. Melanie is sort of like this generation's version of Scarlett's mother. Um, she's like the moral center, you know, of everybody. Um, she's kind of frail and sickly, but like ultimately she's like strong deep down. So in that way, she's again kind of that like steel magnolia sort of deal. Um, oh, that's what I meant to say earlier. There's the steel, there's the velvet fist in the steel magnolia. Sorry. So she's really flawless and it, of course at, at first Scarlett hates her because she you know she calls her like mealy mouth and like spineless and of course she does seem that way she's so polite and she's so meek and she's so subservient but one of the things that we find out of the course of the story is that Millie's got a spine of steel you know like she's she's prepared to stand up for what she believes in um, but she's also deeply popular she's really kind um, and so in a lot of ways Scarlett hates her because she's everything that Scarlett is not uh, but over the course of the story I think Millie really proves to be like the real exemplary southern woman Oh, also, that's Olivia de Havilland, um, and she is still alive. She is 103, um, and she was in a lot of movies. She has, I think, perhaps even more than one Oscar. Um, she's amazing. So beautiful. Still very beautiful, which, like, how? You're 100 years old. But anyway, she's the only one who's still alive, I think. Um, and then, of course, Red Butler. Game changer. Um, so they thought about not having Red Butler for this role because he was a little bit too old, um, but there was never anyone but Clark Gable who could have played him. So he is really iconic um, as a character, especially for his smirking, so good at smirking, and of course for that thing that's final line. So he is a great character because he represents um, the South being willing to change. So in, in the book, it's a little bit more clear, and in the movie, they allude to it a little bit, but he is not received. And what that means is that he is considered so scandalous that people literally don't let them into their house. Um, so if he came over to pay like an afternoon call, which again, people used to do, people would, again, literally not let him in. Um, so essentially what happened, and, and they, they allude to it in the movie, but essentially what happened is he took this girl out driving in his carriage, um, and the carriage broke, and so they had to walk home, and they arrived home after dark, and then he did not marry her. 
So the problem was that they were out alone together, especially after dark. So the assumption was that they had had sex, which meant that now he had to marry her, but he didn't want to marry her. And so he didn't marry her. And when they're whispering about it on the stairs, what Scarlett's asking is, but did that girl get pregnant? And she's saying no, but she's ruined all the same. And so that girl's brother called him out in a duel and he killed her brother because he's a great shot. Uh, and that was embarrassing. So we had to leave Charleston. So anyway, so that's Red Butler. So he has been traveling all around the world and all around America, and he has seen some shit. So that's why he knows um, that, for instance, there are not enough factories in the South, uh, that the South is pretty much definitely going to win because they don't have any supplies. Um, he knows that all of the cotton is there, but you can't sell it if you can't get out. So his contacts in New Orleans and in the North and in New York, essentially, and in London proved to be really popular later, but he's the only one who's been like out there in the world making these contacts. So again, he is symbolic of the new South. He is symbolic of rejecting old money and going forward into the future kind of bravely. So, I love him and his tiny mustache. All right. Um, so in the book, in the movie, they, they kind of gloss over this really quickly. But Charles Hamilton is Scarlett's first husband, and he is very much of the Old South. He's very much like Ashley, um, and he goes to war. Uh, he's there for like two weeks, and then he dies of pneumonia while he's in camp. So he's not really very honorable. So this is kind of an interesting thing because they're forced to hold him up, you know, and to, and to act like he was the greatest and to like honor his memory and to name all the children after him, to have a sword, et cetera, et cetera. But he is, again, sort of representative of a lot of the boys who went to war and just like couldn't hack it. And one of the things that we'll talk about in a minute is that a lot of soldiers died from diseases. More soldiers died from diseases than from gunshots. The real problem with this war was that we didn't have antibiotics yet. Uh, but he sort of represents like the quickly falling Southern boy. Like he had, again, a whole future in front of him. Like he owned, you know, this beautiful house in Atlanta. He had this whole like, um, like money, you know, left from his parents, like he had a whole future, but it ended very quickly with the war. So Scarlet married him, you know, just, just to be a bitch essentially. Um, and then he just died immediately. In the book, they have a baby and in the movie, they leave it out, which I think is a good decision. So that brings us to the like three black people who have names. So this is, again, very symbolic of the larger problems of the movie. Um, so there's the house slaves, which is, of course, Mammy and Pork. So Mammy is, well, it's kind of hard to explain, in a sense. A Mammy is sort of like a nanny, except that often they live with you for your whole life. Um, so it's, it's not exactly a maid, it's more of like a personal servant, uh, like she wouldn't have done any of the cooking or cleaning probably, because it's actually a really elevated status um, in regard to slavery, right? So it's, it's, it's on its own scale, but out of slavery, um, the mammy is like pretty respected. Um, they sort of run the female members of the house, they're in charge of like, you know, clothing and raising the babies. They sort of supervise all of the other slaves, and you can tell with mammy that she's in charge. Um, and so she was originally actually uh, Scarlett's mother's mammy, and so she, you know, follows the family. So, so she'll raise several generations of their babies, probably. Um, the way that they portrayed her was in some ways kind of accurate. Like she probably really did love those babies. She raised them. And in other ways, not very accurate at all. Like she has no personhood outside of this family. Like what about her own babies? Like does she have a family? Like does she leave the house? You know, like she's in a sense, a kind of a well-drawn character because she's so sassy. And I just, I like, I love every part where she mutters to herself, but loudly. Um, but at the same time, like she's not really a fully drawn character. Like we know nothing about Mammy outside of when Scarlett is looking directly at her. So she did uh, win the, the Oscar for this performance which I think is kind of great but at the same time like it was it was by design a limited role so she is sort of like the head you know the female slaves and then pork is essentially like the butler so technically he's Gerald's valet um, okay so this is a person who parks your car is a valet a person who is like the male servant to um, the head of the house is a valet I don't know. Um, so uh, in, in the book, uh, Gerald won him in a poker game. So it's like, you know, degrading on degrading. Um, but he is essentially the butler of the house. So he's like the head male servant and he's in charge of everybody else. So after the war, there are like two of the only slaves who are left um, and they have to do a different variety of work. And that's also meant to be symbolic of the idea that in the older times, there were a lot of people underneath them to do all the work. But in the new times, they have to like do stuff and they don't like it. So. Um, there are a lot of farm slaves. It's literally a plantation. One of them has a name. So again, this is part of the bigger picture. Um, on the one hand, the story's not about them. On the other hand, like, wow. Wow. So the only one who has a name uh, is Big Sam. 
he's kind of great. So he's the foreman. Um, and we see him a couple times throughout the movie, which is why he necessitates a name. But there's probably at least a hundred other slaves, maybe more. It's like a medium sized plantation. So like probably about a hundred slaves and we never see any of them. Um, we also never see where they live and we never see what they eat. Later on, we see some of the like slave houses burnt down when we do like outside pictures of Tara. Uh, but the fact that they are just not really people is again sort of symbolic of what's going on in the rest of the movie. So yes, they have a bunch of slaves. Are those slaves happy? Are they well treated? Do they have somewhere to live? Do they have enough food? Like it's never even addressed. Like it is just so far out of Scarlett's like mind that it's just not even part of the story. So poor Big Sam. I think he did not get to go to the premiere. So, so this is where I kind of wanted to address this, this again. And this is one of the things I'd like to talk about in discussion this week is this concept of ownership. Um, because it's not unusual to Scarlett. Like she really sincerely believes that she owns all these people. And they do try to show her as like sort of loving them. Maybe not Mamie, they have the whole thing. But like, you know, she does sort of love Big Sam and you know, she's always sort of like happy to see him. But like how inaccurate is that? We don't know, you know? And so on the one hand, Mamie feels like she owns them um, in, in the way that I think often we feel about like the children that we raise and the people that we hang out with. But on the other hand, like she's very clearly owned by them. So this sort of idea of the, the human interaction with your slaves and especially the power dynamic with your slaves, very important. Okay, that's all the characters. Hopefully this is making sense so far. Um, so let's talk about the setting. So this part is actually um, personal to us. So. In the story, um, they live in North Georgia. So actually, let me show you this real fast. Um, they lived in, in Clayton County, which may sound familiar to some of you. Again, I am actually not from here, so just I'll just trust that this is true. Um, but basically, it's, it's kind of still a raw place. People haven't been in Clayton very long. For the most part, when people came uh, you know, to North America, the white people, um, they settled along the coast because it was still way faster to get anywhere by water than it was to get anywhere by land. And also, they needed to ship the cotton out. Um, so essentially people were only just beginning to like climb into North Georgia. So that's why there was so much land available like for, for uh, Gerald. So they tried to sort of set it up like English country life. Um, they would have regular meetings, they would have like balls, they would have picnics, but everybody lived pretty far apart. So there was a lot of like solitude, there's a lot of time spent like, you know, just with your family and just with your land. Um, but the whole thing was very, very clearly propped up by slavery. So a few people owned a lot of the land and they enslaved and employed sometimes, they paid some people, um, everybody else to do all the work. So it, the number one cash crop was cotton, for sure, for sure, although they were growing a lot of hemp at the time. Um, and North Georgia is a pretty good place to grow cotton, um, uh, temperature-wise. So basically, it was just like a rural farm life. The way that rural life kind of is similar now, although of course we have the internet. So they were just pretending to be fancy. So cotton. Um, we don't really grow a lot of cotton in America anymore. Um, we've gotten over it and we, we mostly just build subdivisions now, but cotton was a bit major game changer. Um, similar to the way that, that tobacco was a major game changer in terms of like cash crops for the revolutionaries, cotton was the big game changer in terms of cash crops for the Civil War. So a lot of the issue with the Civil War uh, came down to the necessity for cotton. So the, the entire economy in the South was propped up on cotton. Uh, there wasn't much else that they were doing. There was basically nothing else that they were selling. But the issue was that they grew all of this cotton and then they didn't process it. So they would grow and grow and grow and they put it in these warehouses. And one nice thing about cotton is that it doesn't go off. Once you pick it, it's just still cotton. Um, but they had to send it elsewhere to be processed. So they didn't have the means to create a complete economy for themselves. So even though they were producing as much cotton as they possibly could, they had to send it somewhere else, um, usually to New York, uh, sometimes to Liverpool. And then there it got processed into stuff. So even though they had a lot of cotton, they couldn't use it themselves. And if they couldn't get it out, they couldn't make any money. So that's going to be a problem because essentially what's going to happen is that the Union troops are going to um, create a lot of blockades in the harbors. And then they're going to be stuck with all this cotton. And it's no good if you can't do anything with it. Like you can't eat it. And if you can't sell it to anybody, it's just sitting there. So the cotton itself is just hugely important to the entire Civil War. I mean, certainly to the story um, because it was the source of wealth. But not if you can't sell it. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen a cotton field. Um, the way that it grows is, is you know, it's kind of beautiful, but if you can see these little cotton balls here, it looks, it's a 
ball, B-O-L-E. Um, it sort of looks like a little cotton ball, B-A-L-L. -L. But one thing that's, uh, I think, important to recognize about cotton is that when it's dry and you pick it like this, those leaves are super pokey. It's an it's a awful thing uh, to have to pick. I don't know if you guys have ever done I don't know, like apple picking, that's really chill. The apples are right here. Or like blueberries, that's also very chill. They're right here, there's no thorns. But cotton is like extremely pokey and it comes of age, it comes, it comes ready uh, late in the summer. So picking cotton is just a terrible thing to like ask anyone to do, much less force anyone to do because it's extremely pokey and you just sweat the whole time and it's the worst. Uh, cotton is a great fabric, but I just wanted to be clear that picking cotton, unpleasant. Okay, so, Tara. Um, I should point out, Terra is not real. People keep trying to go to Terra. Um, sometimes plantations pretend that they are Terra for people's, uh, for tourism, but basically it's kind of a medium-sized plantation. So essentially they were like upper middle class. So they worked like upper upper class. They didn't have that many acres, but they did own their own acreage. They did own their own house. They did own their own slaves. So like they're part necessarily of the nobility, but like a lower nobility. So like they can hang. Their, their daughters could have had good marriages, but they're not like super wealthy. The importance here um, is this this focus on land. And Gerald is obsessed with land. And to be fair, that's an Irish thing too. But this is very reflective of what we just talked about with the Revolutionary War. Right? Like everyone was obsessed with owning land because land gave you stability and land gave you personhood in a way. It gave you the right to vote. Uh, it gave you the right to be respected. Like land was in a lot of ways very symbolic. It meant that you were independent. It meant that you were like, you know, your own person. Um, like you probably wouldn't get married until you had your own land. So it's not that Terra is necessarily important because it was like wonderful and beautiful. It's that Terra is important because it was symbolic of the independence of the O'Hara's um, and especially for Scarlet. So there's a lot of talk about like land being the only thing that amounts to anything. And like, I don't know if this stirs something in your heart. It might, um, but owning land like this was, was important economically, but also important symbolically because we're still on this thing where owning land is like American. So not as much anymore. We're running out. Okay. So, now let's talk about some of the weird gender things. Um, so I realized I've uh, used this picture before, but I just love it so much. So one of the crucial things that's kind of going on in the story is that Scarlett is not very good at being feminine. Um, and in this sense, this is because she's trying to sort of like escape traditional bounds, but I wanted to tell you just a little bit about, about the gender roles that were happening at the time in case it makes it more clear. So. For Southern gentlemen, um, it was very, very similar to what we saw with revolutionary gentlemen. So we'd hung on to a lot of the same standards. You needed to be wealthy, uh, you needed to be white, um, you needed to be educated, and, and for Southern men and Northern men both, that did mean that you had to go to university. Um, so there were a couple of universities around the South already. I don't think Oglethorpe, oh, Oglethorpe was already there, I think, right? Didn't I think Oglethorpe came up? Or started in the 1830s or something like that but uh, you know they probably went to like University of Virginia uh, University of Georgia things like that um, but you didn't necessarily have to be good at college you just had to let go but also you had to be masculine in a lot of physical ways um, writing was really important hunting was really important shooting was really important dancing was like all right um, but for the most part these were like country southern um, so I mean there were people who lived in town and we'll see that in a minute but for the most part it was sort of like rough and rowdy sort of uh, aggressive like outside southern masculinity for the women on the other hand it was extremely limited uh we're very much in this like angel of the house period uh where the women are meant to be incredibly dainty um like there's that whole scene where mammy won't let scarlet eat breakfast or no she wants her to eat breakfast so she doesn't eat later uh women were not supposed to have appetites uh not for food certainly not for sex um they weren't supposed to be loud they weren't supposed to be like funny they weren't really supposed to be smart they were supposed to be like really demure and quiet and calm and pretty but then suddenly when you when you get married you're supposed to run an entire plantation so they sort of like raised women all the way up until marriage to be delightful little packages, like to be something that, you know, a man would want. And then there was no real training for what happens after marriage. Like you just, you're just kind of set loose. So your whole training is about like how to attract a husband. And then once you get a husband, it's like, okay, goodbye forever. So people got married really young. Uh, you know, Scarlett was 16 and starting to think about marriage. Most people got married around like 18-ish. Um, 20 was getting a little old. And it was just a really restrained world. Um, like it was, it was literally restrained in the corsets. I don't know if you guys have ever worn a corset. It's 
awful. Um, so there were the corsets and there were the hoop skirts. Um, and I, again, I don't know if you've ever tried a hoop skirt, it's difficult. Uh, I tried it once, it was not something I ever want to do again. Um, so you're, you know, you're, you're strapped in and also you're carrying, you know, these dresses weigh 20 pounds usually, especially the ones that are made of velvet. And so everything was just like bound up and heavy and tense. And the girls had to pretend that everything was delightful and pleasant and great. Um, so, you know, like you were talking earlier uh, about your air conditioning being out. So imagine there just never was air conditioning, but also for some reason you're wearing a corset and a velvet dress. Like it just seems to happen. So again, for men, it was very, large and big and out there in the world and for women it was really very confined um you know once you got a husband really you shouldn't be seen again except to occasionally show people your new baby so um this is again kind of what i was talking about here with this idea that there's supposed to be a dramatic sea change so before marriage women are largely ornamental but after marriage they have to be sort of like military commanders they have to run this whole fleet of you know not just their family their nuclear family inside the house but also all of the house slaves and all of the farm slaves and like all of the people so it's it's a lot to be asking of a woman so it was a very it's, it's a tough way to live i think um this is one of the examples that i wanted to show you so typically during the parties they would have day-long parties because everybody was so far away that if you were going to ride in a carriage you know for like four hours or five hours it better be worth it so what they would do is they would have like a big old lunch, a picnic lunch, um, and then nap time, which is something that I think we should bring back. Um, so all of the women, as you can see, would go like upstairs um, and take off all their dresses and loosen their corsets and like just like take a nap while being fanned by slaves, which that part is not great, but um, I'm kind of into the idea of, of afternoon nap time. And all the men uh, would chill with their like brandy and cigars and, and talk about man stuff. So the parties lasted all day with this break in the middle. So there was like the, the picnic part in the morning and then it was nap time and then it was like the ball and the dinner at night. Um, and they would go on late. Uh, usually the parties lasted until, you know, like one or two in the morning, um, but they could because nap time. So this is just, again, sort of an example of the, the difference that we expect between the masculine and the feminine here. Okay. You guys doing okay? I can't see you. I'll just assume you're doing okay. I'll come check back in here in a second. All right, so, war. Um, so everybody had been talking about war for a while. Uh, as you can see, Scarlett was already really tired of it. Um, and I kind of love that, that energy where she's like, if you mention war one more time, I'm gonna go inside. Like, yeah, Scarlett. Um, so everybody's pretty excited about this war. But one of the things that's really important to remember is what they thought the war would be. So people, people never enter into wars thinking like, oh, this will go on for a few years and it'll be terrible. Uh, most of the time we enter into wars thinking like, oh, this will be over quickly and then we'll come home with all this honor. And this was especially true for the South. There was a lot of pride. Um, there was a lot of like excitement. Um, like in a sense, this is what these boys have been training for. They've been riding and shooting all their lives and now they get to ride and shoot, but like for their family. So basically, people said this all the time, we'll look them in a month. They really thought it would go on for just a couple of years. Sorry. Um, they were just convinced that they were better fighters than the Northerners. And to be fair, kind of, they were. A lot of the um, Union soldiers were recent immigrants who weren't particularly good at shooting, but that turns out that's not going to be the problem. Um, and they were just so sure that they would win because they wanted to so badly and because they believed in what they were fighting and because they had no concept of their own limitations. So when they were getting ready for this war, they really sincerely thought like it was going to go great and it'll be over in like five minutes. And that's important because why else would you go? Um, if we were in person, I would try to demonstrate the rebel yell. I'm sure you guys already know it. Uh, depending on where you, where you grew up, you may have heard people doing this, especially in high school. Uh, but you can look it up online. There's a lot of versions. So the war wedding uh, that Scarlett had and that pretty much everybody had was very, very typical. And we see this with almost every war. So people love to get married right before wars. Uh, they're very afraid that the person won't come home. And also it's really romantic and also it's really exciting. So getting like sort of rush married right before the war was actually incredibly normal. Um, and the side effect of this is of course that we end up with a lot of war widows. And this will be true again uh, in the next war that we talk about and it'll be true again in World War II. Um, so this is a graph of marriage and divorce in the United States. And I just wanted to show it to you because um, you can see these like massive spikes. So marriage is in blue. Um, and I think it's kind of great that they're tracking it from, from 1860, which as you can see, there was, there was uh, a spike in, in marriages before 1860 and then it kind of went down. So that was before the, first, uh, before the Civil War. Um, 
And then here, this is like another spike before uh, World War I, and then after it ends, people came home and got married. That was very exciting. People don't get very married very much in depressions uh, or in recessions. Marriage is actually uh, on the decline right now, but in part, that's because you can't have weddings outside. Um, right before World War II, you see another spike. Uh, during the war, almost no marriages, and then after the war, another thing. So the way that we think about marriage has a lot to do with what's going on in the world right now. And so people tend to get married uh, fast, right before and right after wars. It's very exciting. Uh, there were also a lot of divorces right after the war. It was not a great time. Okay, so a lot of the characters joined the cavalry troops. Um, and I wanted to tell you about this because there's a distinct difference between uh, the foot soldiers and the cavalry soldiers, and that difference is wealth. Well, okay, the real difference is horses. Uh, the cavalry are the, the branch of the army that have horses. And we don't really have much of the cavalry anymore. We used to, but we don't really fight wars on horses anymore, which is good. I don't think the horses ever like that. Um, but basically, to join the cavalry, you had to have your own horse, uh, and you had to have your own gun, and that was obviously limited to the wealthy people, because the really poor people didn't have horses. Um, and so the people who were in the cavalry were already made up of like wealthy landowners uh, or their sons. So when you joined the cavalry, you would bring yourself, your horse, your gun. And if you wanted to, you could bring your own slave uh, who would act as sort of your uh, valet. Like he would, he would, you know, carry things for you and take care of your horse. He'd be like sort of your personal servant. So you could literally bring your own slave to war if you wanted to. So the cavalry, especially at the time, was just made up of whoever wanted to join. It was like a local militias, essentially. And again, almost everyone joined uh, because it was expected of you. And it was, it was definitely expected in regard to your masculinity. Like you, you couldn't not join. Like what kind of bitch would you be, you know? So it was, it was expected that you would join. And if you were part of the landed gentry, you would absolutely join the cavalry. Um, so a lot of these boys joined up uh, and they took their horses and most of them died. Um, so what we end up with after the Civil War is over, which we'll see in a second, is that there's almost no young men around to like marry or, or be fathers, and there's also almost no horses, uh, because all the horses die. So, so. so, here we are, heading into the war, um, and one of the best scenes in the movie, I think, is the part where they're talking about the odds at the war, and Rhett Butler's like, y'all, y'all. <laughs> and he makes the excellent point that they don't have any cannon factories, which is going to be a problem. They don't have any cotton mills, which is going to be a problem. And they don't have any means of making or buying more guns and bullets. So essentially, there are some pluses. Uh, the Confederacy soldiers were willing, they were really game, they were really... Like they meant it, this was personal for them. Um, they knew the land. So this comes back to sort of that uh, guerrilla warfare thing that we first saw in the Civil War, or sorry, in the Revolutionary War. And they had some reasonably good generals who had like pretty, pretty good like war strategies, but that's not enough. Uh, that's not enough to win a war. It certainly was not enough to win this war because they're up against a, an army that is for one thing, bigger than them. They were outnumbered, you know, most of the time. Uh, but also the other army has things that soldiers need like food um, and bullets and clothing. So it was like a bunch of like scrappy boys up against a really like a, an army that had things actually going for it. So at the start, the Confederacy's chances were pretty bleak. So now we get into the part where the war begins. So, oh, actually, pause. Okay, so everybody, look real hard at this picture. Do you see this flag in the background? Okay, tell me what you know about this flag. Tell me if this looks familiar. Turn, I'm gonna actually stop sharing so I can look at your faces. What do you see? Um, is it the flag for the 13 colony? Close, yes. That was where that flag was initially designed. You mean the flag, the big one in the back that had like five or seven stars? I can really count it in time. Yes, oh, okay. So the, the Confederacy had several different flags, yeah. Uh, but that's one of them. But I'm just curious if that flag looks familiar to you. Isn't that like the real Confederate flag? Like, not the one that, you know, you see in like, you know, but fuck Georgia is not really what was, you know, actually flown at the time. Yeah, and that's important. So the one that we see, um, you know, hanging from people's cars, um, that was technically Robert E. Lee's, but like personal battle flag, but people took it on after the war because they really liked it. The flag that you see right here behind uh, Scarlet and Red at the Bazaar was the flag of the Confederacy. So like this was the flag that the Confederacy was like, 
signed off on, like this was technically the right flag for the, for the Confederacy. The reason that it might look familiar to you uh, has to do with something that I only recently learned, which is that is basically the state flag of Georgia. Um, in 2003, we, Georgia went back and, or I think 2003, right, 2001, and adopted that flag, but with like a little thingy in the middle. So this is one of the things that we're going to talk about tomorrow. Um, but I was, you know, I was like looking at this still, and I was like, oh, look, they have Georgia's flag. And I was like, oh, no. So we'll talk about it. Uh, but that, the flag that you see behind them there is the flag of the Confederacy, not the um, X, X1 that was Robert E. Lee's essentially like personal flag. The one you see there is called the Stars and Bars, and that was the Confederate flag. So again, we'll talk about it tomorrow, but uh, I was a little alarmed because I never knew that. All right, where are we? Am I here? No, I'm here. Okay. Uh -oh, so, uh, I think I ruined it. Unshare, unshare. I'm sorry, you guys. It's gonna happen, it's gonna be fine. No, not that one. Um, there it is. Okay. So, the war has started. Um, and what they're doing here is at a bazaar, which was um, essentially like a fundraiser. Um, so people would get together and like sell tchotchkes and food and things like that. And then um, sort, sort of like any fundraiser that you've ever seen at like a church or a school. Basically, the point was just to give people money for basically no reason. Uh, what they did at this one that was really scandalous was they sold the right to lead the dances. And of course, Rob Butler uh, paid to take Scarlett out, which was scandalous because she was in mourning. So, um, so in the war, one of the things that I wanted to talk about and that they made a little bit clear in the movie was women's role in the war. So basically, the women had to do a lot of helping, uh, especially the, the women who were you know, in the South, who were part of the Confederacy. So typically, um, you had a couple of roles. One, you would roll bandages, like you would essentially you know, cut or tear the cotton into small pieces and then roll it up into bandages and then take those bandages to the hospital, pre-rolled, very handy. Uh, but two, you would volunteer as nurses at the hospital. But that was divided into two categories. The married women, could be like nurses on the inside um, and the unmarried women had to sort of deal with convalescence like in the home and this was because they were afraid that you would see penises so essentially if you were married they assumed you had seen a male body before so it'd be okay like you could handle it if you weren't married they didn't want you to look at anything like that so you would mostly hang out with the soldiers who were already convalescing and maybe like write letters home and things like that so the women had to work um, at these civil war hospitals which were gross, we'll talk about it in a second, um, and they did a lot of like, just essentially whatever they could do, you know, making food or like bringing soldiers home to convalesce there, because the hospitals were incredibly crowded. So one of, one of the biggest things um, that was a real problem in the Civil War was essentially sanitation. Um, so, I mean, we had invented soap and water, but they didn't necessarily have it. Um, so they, they had a lot of problems with infections, they had a lot of problems with uh, the complete lack of antibiotics and the complete lack of painkillers. So what ended up happening was that a lot of soldiers um, ended up with gangrene, and gangrene is essentially what happens when a wound becomes infected. Um, and it can, if it goes on for long enough, kill you, because eventually it essentially gets into your bloodstream and it can get into your brain. Um, so they didn't have the means of fixing a lot of stuff. Um, they didn't have the means of cleaning out the wounds. They did a lot of amputations because they didn't really have the means of doing surgery. Um, but they also ran out of painkillers. So if you've ever seen people talk about like bite on a leather strap or like uh, hear somebody say bite the bullet, that's actually also pretty common. The idea was that you would bite down on, on a literal bullet to like distract you uh, from the pain. If you were lucky, you would just pass out. But like, so this is a picture um, of an actual Civil War hospital. I thought it was kind of interesting, especially because um, some of the faces were blurry, and they're blurry because they moved. Uh, pictures at the time took so long to take that uh, unless you held completely still, it would get really blurry. So you can see that there's, you know, essentially just one long hallway with lots and lots and lots and lots and lots, lots of beds. Um, and this is one of the nicer hospitals. Like this hospital, they actually have beds. One of the things you probably noticed in Gone with the Wind was that they ended up treating a lot of people just straight up on the floor at the train depot. Um, so Civil War hospitals were just vicious and, and, and disgusting and terrible. It was just a terrible way to die. Um, also, a lot of people died from typhoid fever. And you've probably heard of typhoid fever. It's one of those ones that comes up uh, relatively often in history books. And typhoid fever is essentially um, a bacterial infection. So we don't see it very often anymore. Um, usually it comes with salmonella, which you probably heard of salmonella too, if anybody ever told you uh, not to eat cookie dough. Um, because sometimes salmonella used to be, anyway, in eggs. So most of the time, people got it from drinking water that had already been affected by the bacteria, uh, like well water or pond water or 
street water, uh, you know, like basically when you become that thirsty, you drink whatever's around. Um, and typhoid was extremely dangerous in this regard because it spreads really fast because there's only one source of water. So a lot, a lot, a lot of people die from typhoid. So here are actually um, some of the stats. And I just wanted to show you this because I think we forget this a lot of the time. So if you look at these ones on the left here, um, this is you know the Union troops here in the middle and the Confederate troops on the side. But if you look at how many people died of wounds and died of diseases, it's outstanding. So essentially, more people died from diseases, from dysentery, and from typhoid than died from being shot or stabbed or in any way in battle. So the fact that Charles died um, from pneumonia while he was in camp was very, very common. Um, and as you can see, it struck both the Union and the Confederate troops. Like the Confederate troops were a little bit worse off um, in terms of like supplies, but more people um, you know, died from getting infected and died from getting these diseases than died from battle itself. It was a real problem. If we look over here, um, on the right, this is sort of a, a tally of what, what happened with the most deaths. And one of the ones that we, that we talk about essentially is dysentery and diarrhea. So <laughs> with typhoid and with dysentery both, one of the side effects is that you end up with intense diarrhea. And if you're already dehydrated and then you have diarrhea, it, it, you go downhill really fast. Like you go into organ failure really, really quickly. And so a lot of the soldiers died essentially um, of these communicable diseases that we just didn't have the means of fixing. So more people died of you know, fevers, of infections, uh, of diarrhea, syphilis, always a killer, uh, scurvy, which is fascinating. Um, delirium tremens is what happens when you are detoxing from alcohol. Um, if, you, if, you, if you drink so much alcohol that you have like an alcohol abuse disorder and then you quit cold turkey, you end up with the shakes. You might have heard people talk about the, the DTs, that's delirium tremens. And so essentially those people died from not drinking um, and insanity. That was fascinating. We hadn't... Uh, quite invented PTSD yet. Um, so we didn't know how to talk about it. So that's what they generally mean when they say insanity. So again, we think of this war being particularly violent and gross, and it was, but one of the things that we've often failed to acknowledge is that a lot of the men died in camp, uh, or they died in hospital, or they died along the road. Like the vast majority of the deaths with the Civil War came from factors other than direct battle. Um, and this is part of what's wrong with this whole war. Like this is, this is one of the things that I think we need to acknowledge. And this is, it changed warfare when we invented penicillin uh, in the middle of World War II. Um, so this is something that was real in the book uh, and in the movie and also in real life. So I just wanted to be clear about that. Like, was everyone dying? Yes, and it was gross. Okay, uh, oh, when people died, um, you had to go into mourning. So mourning was a sort of holdover from British tradition, and typically you had to stay in mourning for a year. So if a family member died, you had to wear all black all the time. Uh, for the first six months, women were supposed to wear a veil, but then after six months, they could take the veil off. Um, sometimes women only wore black for six months, and then they wore like gray and lavender for a few more months, maybe brown. But um, there's this whole sort of storyline about Scarlett getting that green bonnet, and she can't wear it because she's in mourning, because mourning was a very, very serious thing. Um, and typically, if you were in mourning, you weren't supposed to like go out, you weren't supposed to dance or party or anything. Um, but because of the war, people were still allowed to like go out publicly while they were in mourning, because like everything was different, everything was on fire. So mourning was a very, very restrictive thing, especially for women. Uh, men could still go out. Men would wear like a black armband and then go about their business, but women were just like put right back in a cage uh, for, for a year until they could come back out. Oh, I also wanted to tell you about this. Um, so at the bazaar, they talk about Brett being a blockade runner. And a blockade runner um, is basically someone, okay, so let me back up. Let's say, um, Charleston is a great example. Let's say you wanted to get cotton out of the harbor of Charleston. What you would do to stop people doing that was put a bunch of ships sort of like in a row so that you can't sail between them. So what a blockade runner does is figure out how to sail between them. Um, the best way to do this is to bribe them. So <laughs> it's not an honorable position. I mean, you can shoot them and sink their ship, but the easiest way to do this is just to be like, hey, I'm just gonna go over here and here is some gold. And if you could just look over there, you know, and that's what they did. Uh, and so Rhett Butler was a blockade runner, but he's just like a the fancy pirate. Like it was like a criminal activity. Um, so it was considered kind of patriotic if you, if you gave a lot of your earnings back to the South, you know, like he was supposed to be like giving the money back to the Confederacy and stuff like that. But um, blockade runners were just, uh, just fancy pirates. But there's an extraordinary amount of profit. So if, if we ever come back to a war like this, I do encourage you to become blockade runners. It's like 2,000% profit. Okay, so this is kind of the thing. 
Um, and I want you to kind of think about the slide because this is one of the things that I want to talk about um, in discussion on Thursday because there's a lot of questions here that, you know, of course, with stupid Zoom lecture we can't really get into, but the cause was kind of the thing. Uh, people talk about the cause over and over and over. It's sort of, it's code for essentially the Confederacy's cause. And one of the things that it's important, I think, to remember is like why they chose to fight this fight in the first place. And for most of them, it was, it was in regard to their way of life and it was in regard to their homes. Like they wanted to keep doing what they were doing. Um, and in a way, I think that's kind of sympathetic. Uh, we, we want to keep doing what we're doing. Like we like our life the way it is, especially if you're at the top, like, yeah. Stay there, chill. Um, but it's important to remember that the men who were fighting for the Confederacy were fighting for very different reasons than the men who were fighting for the Union. So a lot of the men who were fighting for the Union were actually really recent immigrants. Uh, they had like just arrived in America. They used to go like um, to Staten Island and, and, and like, you know, pick them up after they came off the boats. And most of them were only fighting so that they could get some food and then some money and then maybe on some land. So essentially, most of the people who were fighting for the Union did not give a fuck. They were just like, oh, I heard you'll feed me, like, I'll take it. Um, but most of the men fighting for the Confederacy, like, had feelings about it. So that's going to be an important thing for us to remember. So this did begin to change as the war went on. So remember these questions for later. But also, this is a very, very short overview um, of the war itself. So on the left, these are, you know, the, the major battles. Um, one thing that's weird about the Confederate War is that the Union and the Confederacy often use different names for the same battle. Um, we'll talk about that, but anyway, and the dates. And the thing that's important to remember about this is that for like a minute, for maybe like a year, it kind of did look like the Confederacy would win. Um, they had two, you know, major victories at Sumter and at Bull Run, uh, or Manassas, depending on which army you're fighting for. But basically, because they had um, these two sort of massive victories, um, especially in the spring and in the summer, for a minute, it looked like it was going to go okay. Um, and that's important, again, to remember because it, that's what kept them fighting. That's what kept everybody in the South sort of like feeling like this might go somewhere. Uh, but from, from there on out, it was kind of, kind of a disaster. Um, the, the submarine battle there is so cool that we have submarines, um, wooden submarines for a while, which what, but anyway, um, so the, that battle was sort of a draw, but after that it was just Union victories all the way out, um, especially towards the end when, when, uh, Sherman came through. So basically I wanted to show you this because it's a very brief overview of what happened, but it's important to acknowledge that for a minute it kind of did look like the Confederacy would win, and then it was like, eh. And then it went on for several years because nobody will ever stop. Okay, so now we get to the part that's very personal, uh, which is Atlanta. So this is kind of exciting because it's something that, again, if we could go on field trips, we could go out and look at. So um, originally, Atlanta was named Terminus, uh, which I think is very cool, and I think maybe we should consider renaming it. Um, but it was called Terminus because five different uh, rail, railroad lines met in Atlanta. So that was the main strategic importance of Atlanta. Uh, basically, it was a railroad hub. So it was really important in regard to like getting things to the soldiers and to shipping things away. Uh, and it was like a good way to ship actual soldiers and people everywhere. So Atlanta was kind of nothing up until the Civil War started. And then the railroads became so important that Atlanta itself became important. So it changed from Terminus, even though that's so cool, to Marthaville, but Marthaville didn't really last, and then it became Atlanta. So over here, this is um, like a sort of a bird's eye drawing uh, of Atlanta right after the Civil War, which I think is really cool. A lot of those streets are still sort of there. I wish we had kept this grid pattern. Atlanta's such a disaster. One day we'll talk about it. But anyway, so Atlanta was itself really new money. Uh, it was it was a new town. There's a bunch of new money. Everybody's really excited. There's all this money to be made. Everybody's like, pew, 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 pew. There's trains. Like it was it was something that people hadn't really seen before, especially in the South. It might be sort of comparable to New York City, perhaps, but nobody had ever seen anything like this in the South. Um, so it was exciting. And if you think back to those um, scenes from the movie where people were, you know, getting off trains and selling things and buying things, even after the war, like it was really hectic um, and crowded and just like brand new. So. Atlanta had a major role in the Civil War, largely because of these railroads. Um, oh, I forgot about this. This is a picture of Atlanta right before the Civil War. Isn't it cool? This is, oh no wait, this is right after, this is 1882. Anyway, um, I think there are a picture here. And so some of these buildings are still there. 
uh, some of those chargers might look familiar. But I just wanted to show it to you so that you could get an idea of how big the roads were and how big the buildings were. Sometimes I think that helps to imagine it. Um, because it wasn't like a wooden shanty town, like people were building with bricks and stuff like that, but they hadn't paved the roads yet. So all that mud that you saw um, in Golden Green was a real problem. Peachtree was kind of famous for being really muddy. It's a good thing they finally paved it. During the war, Atlanta, super important. And one of the things that made it important, which is gonna come up here in the movie in a second, was that they had all of these ammunition depots. So essentially that's just a great big old warehouse with a bunch of ammunition in it. Um, and so there was a lot of valuable stuff stored here. Um, and that's one of the things that made it strategically important because the idea was if we could take Atlanta, if, if the union could take Atlanta, then they could essentially win the war. Um, so Atlanta was strategically important because of all the stuff that was stored here and also because of the ease with which you could get sort of in and out of Atlanta really, really rapidly. For a while, they tried to like um, do manufacturing, like there were a couple factories, but they got kind of squished. So for a little while, uh, when the Union got to Atlanta, Atlanta went under martial law. And martial law is, is when the military comes over to run your city. Um, so we don't see martial law very often. It's really almost always only happens uh, in war. Sometimes we see it in like hurricanes, like after Katrina, parts of New Orleans went under martial law. Um, if these uh, riots continue, we might see a little bit more uh, the resurgence of martial law. But basically, um, they suspended habeas corpus. And that's important because habeas corpus is one of our most important American rights. And it means that you cannot be um, convicted without a trial. You must have a fair trial. You must have a speedy trial. You must have a judge, uh, if not a jury. But when you're under martial law, you can suspend habeas corpus. And what that means is that the same person can decide that you are guilty and murder you on the spot. So this is very un-American. Uh, one of the things that's like vital to our constitution is this idea of a fair trial. So when you suspend habeas corpus, it gets real dark real fast. Um, so this is important because the Union troops could just decide someone was guilty, pretend to have a trial, and murder them the next day. And that did happen. So, so when they finally got to Atlanta, I just wanted to show you this a little bit because um, they describe it in the in the movie, I think, really, really well. There's that very famous scene from the crane when you're watching Scarlet pick through all the soldiers because she's going to get Dr. Mead because Melly's having her baby, and it like backs up and backs up and backs up, and there's all these people laying there on the street. Love that scene. That scene was like a, a technological masterpiece. No one had ever done anything like that before. Nobody had ever used a crane like that before. It was like a shocking piece of uh, technology to everybody who was involved in movies at the time. So. The problem uh, and the reason why all the soldiers were down there and, and Atlanta was burning was because it was uh, besieged on three sides. So if you look, this is again, like I'm not gonna get too into like a military uh, technology or, or, or war things here, but I just wanted to show it to you because I think it makes it a little bit more clear in regard to what we saw in the movie. So basically um, a siege is when the military surrounds you in such a way that you can't get out. And what they did was they managed to create a siege on three sides. Um, so if you look at this map, you can see that you know, Atlanta is sort of like down there in the middle um, and the, the Union Army surrounded on three sides. So there was never really any hope. That part where Charlotte's trying to get out of town and the whole of Atlanta is on fire, that was real. And that was the first or second time, I think, that Atlanta burned down. Atlanta burns down every once in a while. And this was basically the first time. Um, so this picture on the left is, is real from the time. And this is, I just wanted to show you, because this is one of the fences that they built to defend Atlanta. So basically, if you don't have a lot of tools, this is a pretty effective fence because you, you know, you take this log and you make some holes in it and then you put some sticks in it, um, like in a little sort of an X shape. And as you can imagine, that would be really hard to climb or jump or, I don't know. So anyway, if shit ever hits the fan and you need to build a fence out of a pine tree, this is how you do that. Um, on the right is just a, a, a clearer map of essentially what was going on. Um, and if this is a thing that interests you, I encourage you to look at it, look it up because this was uh, you know, a pretty seminal battle. But essentially surrounded on three sides and they're burning it all down. So they had to uh, burn it down in part because there was, there was so much ammunition stored in Atlanta. Remember I was talking about those munitions depots. And so there were a couple of factories and stuff like that. So the Confederate Army literally set their own stores on fire. Um, so there's, they, they talk about it in the movie, there's that part where they're like, oh shit, they're, they're burning the factories. And so that's what they did as they were retreating. Um, they set their own city on fire, um, and then they set the you know, munitions on fire, and then they kind of retreated. So the part where that's happening is real. Oh, also, the part where that's happening, 
also a technological masterpiece. Uh, what they did, the studio for the movie, was they burned a bunch of old sets that they had, including the set of King Kong, which I think is kind of interesting. And again, nobody had ever done that before. They had never made a real fire that was that big. It scared everybody in LA. Everybody like called the fire department. They were like, LA's on fire? Uh, because they had never like done something that big and they had to get it right in one take, right? Because they can't burn down all the sets again. Um, so that was another like big, you know, sort of cinematic, uh, change that we saw that part with did they arrive by sea or land what 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 did they arrive by sea or land land why not the sea that seems like it would be strategically more um appropriate just too far away uh they were just they were okay. coming north you know from the land and and they will go to the sea uh to get back out but nope had to get yeah. here by land okay so basically burning Atlanta down was a means of cutting off the Confederate army. Um, and also I wanted to show you this guy because I, I feel weirdly sympathetic towards him. Um, his name is Orlando Metcalf Poe, which what a name, right? Um, and it was his job to destroy cities in like a practical and efficient way. Um, and a lot of his journals survive and they're hilarious. They're really sympathetic, I think. I think he was kind of asperger -y, and his favorite thing was destroying things, um, but he was like, in, into it in a very scientific and like responsible way. So he was literally assigned to destroy Atlanta and he took it really incredibly seriously and he got really mad at people who started fires he didn't tell them to start. Because <laughs> he, ha he had this whole, this whole vision for how he was gonna responsibly burn down Atlanta. Uh, he knew exactly how he wanted to do it, to be maximum efficient uh, and then everybody did it wrong. So I feel weirdly sorry for him, but I don't know why. I don't know why, I just think he's interesting. All right, so Atlanta, done. Um, so what happens next is essentially a campaign of demoralization, um, and this is a total war, which we'll talk about in a second, but basically this is where Sherman comes in, and you've probably heard of General Sherman, people in the South still talk about him as being like the worst, um, and what he does is he basically just moves like a swarm of locusts uh, through Georgia, through South Carolina, uh, through parts of Florida, I think, if it gets far, that far down, and his instructions were to like just take anything that they needed so he and his soldiers uh they do what they call sherman's march to the sea they just march all the way down to the ocean and they eat anything they can eat they burn anything that's burnable they take anything that's valuable uh they did a lot of like rape and murder like it was dark it was it was a very dark time and um basically what they called it was a scorched earth policy and you may have heard of this, we see this in wars occasionally, but it's actually kind of rare because this is dark shit. So basically, they're not just destroying military stuff, which is part of the course in war. They're destroying, like, houses and churches and schools. Like, it's, the, the goal is, like, to destroy the land. Like, you might have heard people talk about, like, salting the earth. It's sort of like that. So it's not militarily strategic in the sense that they're not knocking out uh, munitions depots like we just saw. They're just burning. They're just destroying and a major part of this was that they were trying to destroy morale um so the the confederates like they knew the war was over and they knew that they were losing but they wanted to like let them know um so this is sherman's order specifically and i just wanted to show you this because it wasn't like he was out of control like this is what he was meant to be doing so he basically said we're going to destroy the mills and the houses and the cotton gins um we're going to like burn down any house where we suspect people are hiding soldiers, because that was relatively common at the time. Like if your people came home, you would sort of hide them. They said in districts and neighborhoods where the army is unmolested, um, essentially they're gonna destroy them. So it did, if anyone comes into contact with them, if they try to stop them, they're gonna destroy them. They're literally burning bridges behind them. Uh, you know, they're obstructing the roads. They're basically uh, a devastation more or less relentless. So his, his orders, were to cause this massive devastation, and he did. Um, so if you've ever heard about people talking about Sherman being like the worst, this is what they're talking about. And to be fair, we don't often see this kind of thing. Um, this is this is you know kind of low down. This idea that you would destroy things that were not technically related to the war. So Sherman came through. Destruction, destruction, um, and then we start to deal with the post-war reconstruction. So this is a very tricky time uh, in American history and especially in Southern history. And this is a lot of what we're going to talk about tomorrow. But basically, um, 
the reconstruction was essentially the South reckoning with what to be, like how, how to become. Uh, because all of the things that they held to be vital were kind of gone. Like for one thing, everything was literally gone, it had been burned down, but also their way of life was heavily predicated on slaves and they don't have that anymore. So the reconstruction was a tricky, tricky thing. So the first thing that happened um, at, the, at the end of the Civil War was that legally all of the slaves were emancipated, uh, which meant that legally you cannot anymore own another human, you cannot own another slave, except in cases of imprisonment. Uh, for whatever reason, we decided it would be legal to act like slaves or prisoners. Um, you could probably be thinking about this lately because Friday was Juneteenth. So technically the slaves were emancipated at the end of the Civil War, but there were parts of Texas where they didn't find out that the Civil War had ended and the slaves were emancipated for two and a half years two and a half years. Um, and so the day that they finally made it down to Texas and they were like, oh shit, did y'all not know you were free? Um, that's Juneteenth, so that's why that's celebrated. And that was last week. So the emancipation um, was, a, was a big old deal because on the one hand, no one knew what to do because now all of a sudden you have this whole like wealth of free people, but they don't have anywhere to go or anywhere to live. You know what I mean? Like it's not like they freed them and then built them housing. They were sort of like, loose in the cities. Um, and so a lot, a lot, a lot of the former slaves moved north. They were basically like, I am done with this shit. It was the first big migration. Uh, there'll be another migration later. But a lot of people just moved north and they were like, you know, by Galatia. Um, but a lot of people stayed and became uh, you know, free workers. Um, a lot of people stayed and became sharecroppers. Um, a lot of people stayed and were essentially still just slaves. Um, the way that they painted in the movie is again, part of the like massive racist overtones. Uh, Mammy and Pork stayed, which wasn't entirely uncommon. Sometimes people did stay with their family. Um, a lot of slaves started earning money uh, and became sort of like, aggressive about it, which I kind of don't blame them, like I might do with them. So this is again one of the things that I would like to talk to you about in discussion, especially in regards to like what you've heard about this since then. Um, because one of the things that started to happen was that there were a lot of carpetbaggers, and carpetbaggers were people from the north who, who came down south to essentially take advantage of the recently freed slaves. And do you remember the scene in the movie they were talking about 40 acres and a mule? And you've probably heard that phrase before. Um, and what happened was that the carpetbaggers essentially promised them that if they voted for the right candidates, they would give them all 40 acres and a mule, uh, which was a great deal. Uh, that would, I mean, that would really like get you started. Uh, but of course, they never did. Nobody ever got 40 more or a mule. So yes, everyone was emancipated, but also they didn't have any money or any education or anywhere to go or anything to do. So it was, it was kind of a monkey's paw situation. Like, yes, you have freedom, but like, what are you going to do? So this was one of our, our major, again, uh, systemic racism failures was this idea that in the North, they were like, you're free, but then they didn't do anything. So in the movie, they only sort of skirt around this, but this is one of the things that we'll talk about. So this, I just wanted to show you because it's one of the most famous lines from the movie. Uh, but basically, during the Reconstruction, there were huge problems um, with, with food uh, and with work and with money. Because, again, their means of earning had been destroyed. Um, all of the cotton was literally gone, but also all of the people who pitched the cotton were gone. So you didn't have this, this vital piece of your economy that you had been working on. So a lot of Southerners who did survive the war died in the decades after the war, um, essentially from starvation. Because they didn't know how to do things for themselves and also they didn't have the means of doing what they used to do so for scarlet she's sort of dealing with this and she's like you know what like i would rather be morally bankrupt than be hungry so that's what she chooses um which again kind of modern i don't know i'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what she gets think about that on thursday but she said basically as god is my witness i'll never be hungry again and she never was she just married a couple more bitches and took care of business so um in the movie they dance around this a little bit um, but essentially Scarlett's second husband, Frank Kennedy, was a member of the Klan, and so was almost all, of, or so were, sorry, almost everybody they knew. So the first iteration of the Klan, and we'll talk about this a little bit uh, tomorrow, but the first iteration rose directly following the war. And it was sort of a fraternal organization, and the point of it was to keep the freed slaves under control. Because uh, the freed slaves were very scary for them. Um, there were all of these people and they were loose and they had never been loose before. They were worried that they wanted revenge and some of them did. Um, so the first iteration was essentially men controlling the newly freed slaves and very often accusing them of crimes they didn't commit and just outright murdering them. So there was a lot of lynching, there was a lot of murder, there were no trials, there was no habeas corpus. Like it was, it was basically a secret fraternal group. They had a lot of rituals. Um, the K thing started then. Um, 
the hoods and the rope started then they even had like hoods and ropes for their horses which I always find kind of funny like who's the horse hiding from uh but basically their eagerness to kind of put life back together to where it was by merit of holding down the black population just totally set civil rights back at least 100 years like we could have achieved the first civil rights you know movement here uh like in the 1870s and we just didn't because basically these men were too afraid to let go of the way that their life had been and so they just sort of pushed it all the way back so the first iteration of the plan is here um and of course it's also directly related to atlanta we'll talk about that at stone mountain um but this was the, the the big reaction, especially to the men who had previously been powerful, um, they were horrified by their new poverty and their new hungriness and their new lack of power. And so this is one of the things that they did to sort of like make themselves feel better. Not a great move. Not a great move. Um, everybody else was trying to figure out what to be. So for a lot of people, like they, they sort of dealt with it a little bit in the movie, like people started taking in washing or they started making pies and selling them. Uh, but for a lot of people, they had never had a job. Um, they didn't have to do. They had education, so they didn't know how to do anything. Like Ashley, I think, is a really good example of this. Like Scarlet bullies him into running the mill, but he's terrible at it and he hates it. So for a lot of people who had previously been wealthy, they ended up losing all of their money and just sort of like quietly starving to death um, because they didn't know how to work in this new world. And, and to be fair, I would imagine that that depression and anxiety played a big part in this. Like mental health is certainly going to take a decline when your world explodes. Um, but it was an interesting sort of social change because people who didn't know how to do anything lost everything and, and, and quietly kind of died. And the people who did know how to do something or the people who were willing to learn how to do something or like Scarlet, the people who were willing to commit kind of low-key crimes thrived. So like Brett said, there's a lot of money to be made in reconstruction. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made selling you know, lumber and selling construction materials you know, specifically. Um, but they were one of the couples that managed to succeed in part because they were working with the Yankees. They were like doing a lot of trading and sales with the Yankees, which a lot of people disapproved of because they were like, but that's our enemy. Uh, but again, Scarlett has made her decision, man. So um, they do okay uh, and they survive, but in large part it's because they openly reject the old ideals. They openly reject the previous way of life. And so there's, in the, in the movie, they do kind of a good job showing the way that this is contentious. Like they're not necessarily able to hang out with people they used to hang out with. And even members of their own family are like outright dismissing them because they've made this massive social change into something that a lot of people find super distasteful. Um, so that's actually one of my favorite scenes in the movie, this, this picture that I have on the right, uh, where they're sort of strolling their baby around town and Rhett realizes that everybody hates them. And it's uncomfortable for him because he wants his daughter to be you know, successful and to be part of the right kind of society. And so he undergoes this massive change. But um, I, I just think those are some of the best costumes of all time. Again, lots of problems with this movie, but the costumes are um, So this is, again, one of the things that we'll uh, sort of continue to talk about tomorrow and, and, and in, the, in the course of discussion on Thursday, this idea that which one is more important, uh, your previous society or surviving? And people make different decisions based on, you know, what's, what's personally important to them. But this is one of the central themes of the book, this idea that, that Scarlet is sort of a modern woman because she rejects her own society. But a lot of people do not approve this decision. So, now, essentially, at the end of the movie, uh, aside from the dramatic parts and, and, and how Robert Butler does not give a damn, uh, what we're essentially looking at is this really divided society. Um, there's a lot of people who are sort of romanticizing and wishing for the way that things were. Uh, the people who are, you know, sort of obsessed with this old South, with the glory, with the beauty. And there's a lot of people who are building a new world, um, who are building, literally rebuilding Atlanta, uh, who are, you know, working in business, who are working in finance, who are working with the Yankees. And so, again, the, the book and the movie both are kind of about what happens when your world explodes. Do you change with the times or do you chill uh, and, and quietly die? Which uh, those are not really the only two options, but those are essentially the two options presented in the book. So ultimately we end up with whether or not you can adjust uh, to a new way of life and whether or not you can adjust to like essentially the world around you in such a way that you can continue to thrive. So ultimately that's what the movie is about. I think. Also so, about so, Scarlet making tremendously bitchy faces. I'm sorry, I don't know how to raise my hand on here. Um, that is okay. I am gonna come back to the main screen here. I think I can see you guys now. Yes, I can. Okay, great. Yeah, what kind of questions do y'all have? Well, I have a current event um, in NASCAR. Yeah, NASCAR! Who knew that would show up? Well, in terms of 
racism, somebody left a noose in Bubba Wallace's garage. Yeah. And that's yeah, the, what I the expected only, from NASCAR. The, the singular one uh, black driver in NASCAR. But, you know, shout out to them. They, you know, they didn't really just kind of like take it lightly. So, yeah. All the other drivers came and stood behind him and like walked into the thing. Like, who knew NASCAR was going to be on the front of progressive politics? I love it. Maybe I'll go to NASCAR now. No. So, what kind of uh, questions do y'all have after a big old chunk of information? Thank you. I love learning, and you just taught me a lot about the Civil War pre and post. Good. Yeah. And the book is going to really make a lot of this clear. I'm so excited for the book. I never anticipated that we would all be talking about the Civil War again in 2020, but like, surprise. It's kind of, kind of thinking back to something we talked about. Have you heard of the, the Streisand effect? Yeah. That's really like with them taking it off, you know? Yeah, so the like, Streisand effect is... Um, Wait, what was Streisand herself mad about? I forget. She said, I, the, on, I think it was an unflattering photo or something. That's right. Yeah, so the, like somebody had an unflattering photograph of her and she pitched a fit and wouldn't let anybody publish it, which made everybody tremendously interested in it. So everybody demanded to see it. So it like really backfired and everybody saw that picture after that. But yeah, that's kind of famous. They were basically like, you can't watch Gone with the Wind. And everybody was like, watch me. And they bought it. What's, what's funny is, you know, like, have you, I don't know if you've seen that, that picture where if you buy some like old cartoons, like, Tom and Jerry and stuff, a lot of them will have like a little notice at the beginning and it's like, hey, these, you know, these have uh, some racist stuff in it, but we're not going to censor it because that would be pretending that these weren't the attitudes at the time and that screwed up, essentially, I'm paraphrasing. So I really kind of feel like, you know, they kind of shot themselves in the foot by, by removing it instead of like doing that because I feel like, you know, I don't know. No one seemed to have a problem with, you know, that, that comics thing. So it's like, come on now. From what I understand, that is their plan. Uh, they've, they've hired a very specific woman. I found the article. I'll post it on Moodle again. Uh, they hired somebody to, to do a forward, and they're going to re-release it with her being like, here are some problems, uh, which I think is the right decision. Because I think Disney did something admirable with that when they came out and they said, like, this is racist, but it did happen, and here we go. You know, good old Walt is probably turning in his grave. Oh, Walt. He's not buried, right? Isn't he frozen upright or something creepy? Yeah, who knows, man. <laughs> I don't know either. Um, any other concerns about the movie before we come back and talk about why everybody loves it so much? Okay. Uh, I am I'm really excited to hear from you guys on Thursday, especially uh, whether you watched it with people. So what we're going to do tomorrow um, is talk about essentially the impact that the movie had culturally. Like so many people saw it and so many people loved it that it has had like a really outsized impact for a movie. Um, so if you haven't watched it, focus, watch it. And otherwise I will see you guys tomorrow at 11 and we will talk about why everybody loves this movie so much. All right. I'll see you guys soon. Goodbye. Bye. Dr. B. Dr. B. Yes. Hold, hold on. Let me stop recording just in case.